let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about? And welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay. And if you enjoyed our music today, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring My Adore. And you can pick it up on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to raise everyone's voice around the world. So that starts with the person from dementia to their family and friends, to business professionals, to authors, musicians, researchers, advocates, you name it. Everyone can make a difference and we want to hear how you're doing it. So reach out to me at alzheimerspeaks.com. And to our listeners who um, are so loyal, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. You have raised awareness of all of our programming, not just the radio show, but our dementia chats and dementia-friendly gatherings and memory cafes and dementia quick tips and our blog and our YouTube channel. Your likes, your clicks, and shares matter, and you are sharing information in your spheres, which will help somebody else in need feel comfortable clicking on that information when the time is right for them. So again, thank you so much. I do want to give a shout out to the Memory Cafe directory. Dave has just done a fabulous job. It's now not just a directory for U.S., but um, other countries as well. So go to Memory Cafe directory. You can click on Cafe Connect and get information about virtual cafes as well. And I also want to give a shout out to Coral Health because during this COVID thing we're going through, they are giving away Music First and Coral Faith. So go to Coral Health today and you won't be disappointed. And you can take these apps anywhere you go. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guest today. So I'm so excited to introduce you to Salish Mishra, uh, who is a social entrepreneur, a mentor, and the founder of Silver Linings, which is a group in his community that's dedicated to senior citizens in India. And since, uh, I think it's uh, 2008, Silver Linings has worked towards creating elder-friendly world. Um, where aging becomes something positive and rewarding. And, you know, I'm pushing 61, so I'm really getting that now, how important that that really is. And um, not just from a selfish perspective, but I guess I've been interested in that all of my life since I've been really little. But I, but I don't think we've done enough. And so I can't wait to have this conversation with Salish to learn more um, he's worked in dementia care, and he has also founded India's first social enterprise called Assisted Living um, Elder Care Homes, and that was back in 2013. And he's also published a book called Remember Me, You, Me, and Dementia. So welcome, Salish. How are you today? Uh, good morning, uh, Lori. Uh, Thank you for giving this opportunity once again. Uh, I'm very happy and love from India. Wonderful. Well, we, um, we are, like I said, so excited to have you. It's been a while since you were on last. And so um, this is going to be a, um, a really fascinating conversation. I always like to start out with everybody, though, and ask them first if they've been personally touched by dementia. Uh, no, I was not touched. I don't have any history in my family. But I remember after starting Silver Innings and Evans Nanjini that my grandfather in very last stage of his life, 
was suffering with alzheimer but we were not aware so there is no connection for me to start this but it is just i don't know it, it just happened Okay. Okay. Fair enough. It's always just nice for the audience to have a little bit of a base there. Um, why don't we talk about having you share your experience in terms of what got you drawn into working in this market in the first place? Yes. Uh, I come from, again, I keep on repeating, I come from a small village in Mumbai. So being a village person, I have uh, that attitude of humanity to uh, talk about love and care, to talk about people, to be among human beings. Uh, I unfortunately joined a sales marketing team after my graduation. I did not like it. Uh, for 17 years, I was in a marketing company in the corporate world. Uh, I was not enjoying it, but though I was learning something, the marketing techniques and tricks, which is helping me now. Uh, then uh, uh, after some time, after working for 17 years, I uh, happened to work with Dignity Foundation, which is an NGO in India that works with seniors. And I happened to apply as a volunteer and they offered me a job. And working with Dignity, I got all this idea. I, I got connected to real people, uh, to seniors. Earlier, I was not aware who are seniors, who are aged, what is the problem, what are the issues. So here I learned something and I, that touched my heart. There are so many good human beings I came across and they touched my soul and it's continued. The love is continuing. Oh, that's fantastic. So little did they know um, what one volunteer was going to do for the world <laughs> when they, when they <laughs> took, you, took you on board. Now you've started uh, running two elder homes. Why don't you tell us about um, why you decided to open them and you know, are there others like that in um, Mumbai or was this kind of a, a first effort? Yeah, so uh, we started Silver Innings, my group organization in 2008. While working with seniors and the family members, uh, we used to do counseling, we used to do home care, we used to do a lot of awareness talk. We came across frustrated family members where they said, uh, we need a real uh, care, we need home, we need somebody to take care of our parent or husband or wife. So then this idea came to start an assisted living. It is near Mumbai. Uh, but again, the whole concept, the idea came to me from Eden Alternative, Dr. Bill Thomas. His idea was to transforming life to mitigate loneliness, helplessness and boredom. Uh, it talked about human habitat. We connect to human beings with the green, with children, with the birds, with the fruits, with the flowers. So all this idea of uh, making a home, not a nursing home, not a old age home, not a retirement township. So idea was different. We started as the first in India, but now there are few more. I'm very happy that there are many uh, such openings because we there are around uh, 100 and more than 100 million seniors in India and 4% are suffering with dementia. So it is going to be huge. So we need thousands of such homes now. So it is a good, we are happy we started first, uh, but there are many now. Oh, that's fantastic. And Bill Thomas, I mean, what a, what a role model and a mentor and just a visionary, you know, because he started that way back, uh, I want to say in the 70s. And it still took a long time to really get traction even here in the U.S. You know, there's still some fight um, in terms of some of our, our nursing home concepts and things of what home should be like. And, and his, um, his concept is so simple. It should be like your home and my home. It should, it should, you know, it shouldn't be so drastically changed. Can you explain kind of a typical day in the life of, of one of your residents? What, you know, what the morning is like and kind of bring us through, through bedtime? Yeah, so uh, generally when people get up in the morning, so uh, they are in different place uh, it, because the, we have around 10 residents now who are staying there. 10 from the difficult for us is they are from different religion, different language, different culture because India is different tradition, uh, diverse country. So we have people from different background, uh, but staying with us for a long time for three to five years, they have adapted to us and they have they feel secured. So mm -hmm. when they get up in the morning, the first thing people do is like, it, it's, it's a very normal life. I think people are very scared, worried, dementia, I think they're very nice, 
very human very human they get up in the morning they we take them for brushing the teeth going for bathroom uh, there are typical things what we all do but sometimes are difficult example there might be mood swing it might be rainy season it might be winter it might be summer the external environment face difficult uh, difficulty in this and sometimes because of thyroid uh, thyroid is also playing a lot of uh, issues now so because of uh, increase in thyroid or diabetes there will be some mood swing but because of caring staff we overcome all this uh, initially one to us might be difficult but as the days goes along they are all very happy they participate in activity they have food and again sun downing starts after 4 o'clock <laughs> no matter where you are in the world your 4 o'clock is is kind of that ticker yep yeah yes. and and that's just one of those things you know you have to learn how to how to move through it i see on social media you do it it seems like you guys are throwing a party all the time there's constantly music going and um you know arts and just very active happy uh, moments that everyone is engaged in is that is that something you do on, like on a daily basis to try to incorporate those things or is that more of a weekly or monthly basis. I just don't want, when, when I see it, it's just like, that's what I think of when I think of you. I think of just <laughs> fun engagement. Yes, uh, you are right. Uh, when we started, I just said, uh, it's all influenced by Dr. Bill Thomas and his whole idea of creating a home, not a nursing home. So uh, why, what is my home? I love music. I love dance. I love colors. I love to go out. I like to flirt. So, what we do is the same thing we need for them. So that is what we created. And believe me, this is every day. Every day we start with a, of course, doing a daily routine. Then we start with the universal prayer. Prayer also has a music. So we all sit together, we pray together. It might be different language, but music connects. And what we do is we start the day with the group activities. So group, uh, what I found in this is group is one thing which connects, very engage and stabilizes a person. So they will start with the group activity like prayer, then it may be music, it may be some creativity, it may be uh, some dance, it might be brain therapy. So music and dance is compulsory. I can, I can say it's a ritual, a ritual mm -hmm. for us and celebrating birthdays, celebrating anniversaries, Celebrate. India has so many festivals and all are of music and dance and colors. So we try to incorporate everything to make them uh, feel that it is normal. They are not abnormal. We don't behave and don't treat them as abnormal. So I think that is the key. Uh, group is mm -hmm. one thing and telling them and making them feel comfortable being normal is important. Yeah. Well, you know, my mom was in a nursing home and I always, when I was younger, I sold real estate. And so I always helped place people and find them, you know, good alternative homes when families felt they couldn't handle it anymore. And yet when it was my mom's turn, I always wanted her to live with us. And some of my listeners have heard this story before, but I, but I think it's an important one. And we got along really well. My dad ended up being in a nursing home. He had taken a fall and he was never going to be able to live independently. And even though my mom couldn't like pick out her clothes to wear appropriate for the weather, you know, didn't know if she should wear snow boots or flip flops type thing. Um, one morning about three weeks in, she woke up real clear and said, I want to move to the nursing home. And of course, as a family member, all I was was offended. I wasn't good enough. What was wrong? It was all about me. And I said, Mom, aren't you happy? And she said, no, it's not that at all. And she, but in this clarity moment, she said, we've been together 49 and a half years, and I don't want to leave them now. And I'm like, okay, I can make that happen. And I was still apprehensive that that was the best place for her. But I'll never forget walking in and seeing her interact with peers. And it was a really simple activity. They were just looking at a at a magazine double paged with full of flowers and they were all in a horseshoe around the activities person but they were all engaged they were talking about their gardens and the colors of the flowers and and i remember standing in the doorway thinking i can't give her that i'm her daughter i'm not her peer and everybody needs to be, you know feel like they belong to a peer group 
And I think that's one of the biggest overlooked factors of community living is having that, that peer centeredness that um, just kind of fills our soul, makes us feel more independent. Like, you know, we're, we don't have to rely always on family members or whatever, but that we're, we're part of a community. We're part of a bigger thing. And um, I, I just, I think that that is, that is a wonderful thing that you're creating. Now with your staff, since you have different languages, are staff bilingual or how do you work with the different languages and, and the different religions and stuff if everyone's doing everything at one time. Yeah, so uh, our staff, the managers speak English. They are all local, but all the care partners, care staff are Marathi speaking local vernacular medium people. Uh, initially, they did not understand English except the manager. But I think language is not a problem. It's about the attitude. It about smile, it about the body, body language. So slowly, they I found that our uh, care partners, our staff learned the new language, and our seniors also started knowing the language. So because most of the seniors belong to Mumbai region, they speak some local language, Marathi. That's a common language, so they understand something. But again, I'll just share you an example. My colleague, uh, Sylvie Dupont, came from Salvation Army from Paris, France. She stayed with us for six months. When she came, she only spoke French and some English. But she stayed there for six months with all of our staff. She learned, she understood, and the staff also learned. So language is never a problem. It's about smile, body language, your attitude. I think that, that is the co communication is the key. Communication with the touch, with the eye, with the level of uh, uh, um, the, the level in what level you're talking, the tone of the voice. I think that makes a lot of difference. I love that you said that because I'm a firm believer that we do not pay enough attention to nonverbal communication or um, just how we communicate. You know, we're like, hey, come on. You know, we're not even looking at somebody. We're waving them on. And somebody who has a deficit, they need, they need all of this you know, to yes. figure this out. They don't know if you're talking to somebody else. Um, and, you know, it, it, it can really confuse things greatly. So just taking time to slow down, like you said, having the eye contact, having a, a nice tone of voice, not looking like you're all tensed out, um, but that, that, you know, everything's going to be okay. Even if, you know, you're trying to deescalate something, you have a yes. smile on your face and understanding and validating where they're at. And, um, you know, here in the U.S., I think we've sadly pulled away from touch, you know, mm -hmm. because of potential yeah. abuse and how's it going to be interpreted. And, and mm -hmm. that really saddens me because I think touch is so powerful. I just think it is yeah. so powerful to get a hug. And, and um, I think now with COVID, I think people are realizing yes. how much they miss those hugs yes. and that yes. touch and, you know, or those sounds or being able to look in somebody's eyes directly uh, so maybe that'll help us all learn a little bit more too in terms of what what our true needs are and what we really rely on. Because I think a lot of um, what what is considered nonverbal language, people they don't they don't even know that they're taking it in, you know. Yeah. And and that's one of the things I think people with dementia teach us is they're like, hey, I need to read your lips. I didn't know I was reading your lips before, you know, but, yeah. but, but I need all these other factors. And, yeah. and I love too how you um, say that, that both the resident and staff are learning, you know, so yes. it's that, that equal relationship. It's really yeah. um, what I call um, a relationship-based care. Um, yeah. I, I personally don't care. I, I don't know if you guys use the person-centered term, but here in the U.S., I think it's overused and underdelivered, and I think um, I think getting back to that core relationship is real different. Now, everybody around the world is dealing with COVID. How has it touched India, and how have you adapted to still serve the elders? Um, yeah. So this COVID uh, has come in a very big way and created a lot of problem for all of us because it came suddenly. And uh, we, we were never ready for it, actually. 
but what we did we when everything started uh, the covid uh, the news uh, because we read a lot of newspapers a lot of internet news on twitter we found something is coming so way back in on 4th of march we stopped all the visitors visiting to our place so that was the first thing we did uh, and we evacuated uh, the students interns who were working with us we stopped all the visitors we stopped all the family members on the 4th of march in, in fact government of india lockdown came much uh, late like 20th march or something but this is the first thing we did and we also did what we what what is needed in crisis so we sat with our manager and decided we need groceries we need medicine we need diapers i knew it is going to be 2 3 months so we started keeping all this provision ration grocery uh, diapers sanitizer medicine we kept all the stock so this was initially preparation we did then we also sen- sen- uh, 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 sensitize our staff with our doctor like what are things we need like we have to sanitize our hand we have to wash our hand with soap we keep a sanitizer there then we connected to the municipal corporation municipal corporation comes every week and sanitize the place that is there is also one thing we did then we also did what we have for this uh, visiting doctor we uh, see visit every every week but this time we decide decided every week she'll come and identify some symptoms are there some symptoms uh, a cold cough and fever not only in the resident but also the staff and then also taking of the basic hygiene like cutting nails cleaning yourself everybody is taking bath using using something called detol or savlon and also incorporated our diet we need we try to change some diet according to to create a immunity like we started giving some vitamin c tablet as per doctor uh, instruction we take curcumin in the milk warm milk we have basil leaves so basic traditional medicine or, or kitchen based uh, ingredient we started using Uh, in between we had initially we had lot of problem with the staff uh, because of negative and wrong news in the television and whatsapp there were a lot of fear and panic in the staff initial very initial first when the lockdown started so we had to sit and counsel them we have to train them we have to boost their immunity also connect to the family members their family members staff family members because they came from villages other villages which is 100 kilometers away we have to call them we have to do video calling we have to assure them and for the staff also what we did what we started giving some incentive we started giving relieving them we have a other home where we have a place to stay we started doing a shift kind of thing we started making more uh, better environment so s- some of the things we did uh, but in this whole our senior center manager both manager janet and jasmine they helped us uh, Uh, also we had a problem with the uh, traveling like initially village local villagers created a lot of problem but not to allow our staff to travel to home because they thought elders are carrier of corona there, there is a lot of ageist attitude in the society so we 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 talked to the local authority we talked to the police official we talked to uh, local bodies and we created some goodwill in the environment and uh, then the things were uh, very nice but let me tell you the resident inside did not feel anything it's just normal wow um that is not how it went down here in the us at all and about 80% of our deaths have been in senior housing and we still are having trouble um with them getting the proper um protection gear and and things it's just it was it was so sad cuz they knew where the numbers were coming from and yet they were last on the list to mm-hmm. to get provisions. And yes. so community really started stepping up and a lot of them were making masks and delivering them to different communities and okay. families <clears throat> would come to visit but they'd have to see them through the windows. I'm sure you saw pictures of that and and they started zooming and um but yet a zoom call every 2 weeks doesn't cut it for family when they're anxious. and stuff. Yes. So I think we still have to do better. Um some communities actually um in their memory care took out all the furniture and common areas and then mm-hmm. had them stay in their room and even if they wandered out there was no place to sit, no place to do anything. So then their environment doesn't even look the same, you know, mm-hmm. at all. So 
it's only been, and, and this is kind of amazing, but I've talked with people all around the world on this, and, and everyone has said pretty much the same thing. All the residents did well until about three weeks ago. And then they, then they saw a dive in terms of, of the progression of their disease and, and probably just the depression and loneliness, you know, with things. So I think we, we have to learn to do better and to anticipate that this is going to hit again. And how are we still going to incorporate um, activities and engagements and mm. still have that protective gear and, and all those yeah. things. So it's been a big, big learning lesson. The other thing that I really um, hope that communities take away from this is that families want to help. They want to volunteer. They want to be part. And, but you need to coordinate that. You know, yeah. they, they can't do that if you don't let them in. And so they can be your biggest advocate. So that's something that actually I'm trying to work on here in the U.S. is to help okay. communities understand how do you embrace that energy and then how do you counsel families too? Because, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I don't know if you're seeing this in, in India, but mm -hmm. here a lot of people were like, well, I think I'm going to pull mom or dad out because I don't feel like they're safe. And, you know, they were saying, well, you know, I'll just hire home health care. Well, good luck with that. I mean, it's hard finding staff anywhere yeah, and not yeah. understanding that the disease has probably progressed. Their situation has changed. There's a lot more stress just with this COVID situation. Yeah. Are they going to come with you now to go get groceries or is there going to be someone to stay? I mean, all yeah. those little things that we forget about. And so helping families through that process and helping staff understand mm. too um, the importance. We had um, some communities where um, a lot of our staff are part-time in, in homes and okay. so they work multiple jobs and so mm. some supervisors gave them a choice. You can either work here or you can mm. work there but we've oh. got to limit the spread and when this lifts, you'll be, you know, if you choose to go over there, no hard feelings, you'll be welcome back. Mm -hmm. But right now, we have to limit the spread. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard of some where they've had staff do like a week or two week shift at a time where they just stay there. And then, mm -hmm. they, then they're off for a while. Um, that hasn't really happened much here, to my knowledge, in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. do, have you guys done that with having staff live in at all? Yeah, so no, we had staff uh, out of 17 staff, mm -hmm. uh, 10 staff are local nearby, uh, they stay in, uh, around 500 meters away, so they go every day, come in and out, but there are 7 staff who stay there for 24 hours, so they stayed for more than 90 days in February, wow. so, but, but uh, because they were frustrated, they want to go home, the families were calling. So last week, the first two batch of our staff went to their home in the village. So we have taken all the precaution. We have tested them here while going. We gave them some incentives also. And we told them what are things to do or not. And when they come back again, we have to do the test. So we need to care for them. Uh, in India, uh, old, age, old age care is not still under essential services. Government is doing, government is struggling to do other things, other priorities. In fact, uh, uh, 10 days ago, there was a Government of India meeting with all the care staff, uh, home and senior citizens association. I was uh, among them. And the Government of India is do, uh, developing a policy for COVID and elder seniors. Uh, I think in the development, uh, we need standard uh, operating procedure, SOPs for homes, for the staff. In fact, I want to uh, uh, talk about many families, people who stay in their own home. They struggled a lot in the lockdown because they were dependent on the caregiver, care staff coming every day. But mm -hmm. on the lockdown, they could not travel. And family had very, very difficult time to handle, especially dementia people. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I think everything in our world right now is on the cusp of changing. And, and to mm -hmm. me, I, I'm hoping for the better. You know, I think it's going to be a mess for a while, all this turbulence. But it's really mm -hmm. shining a light on how much better we can be as, mm -hmm. as humans and um, how we can build better community as a whole, mm -hmm. be more respectful and, and dignified and, and take in um, 
that that risk versus um, versus living life, you know, mm -hmm. is really yeah. starting to have a conversation that people need those family connections, even if there's a risk of getting ill, you know, yes. they, they need those connections. And that's a tough one. That's a, a tough one because a family's choice is much bigger than just them because of yes. the type of um, disease that this is with COVID. And so it has this ripple effect that, you know, we have to somehow figure out how, how to work with. Um, now you had mentioned, you know, initially you had kind of worked with police and stuff for travel and reaching out mm -hmm. to um, the community. Can you talk to us about some of the, the local communities that you work with and, and how, how are mm -hmm. you working with them? So uh, initially, when we started in 2013, we have been doing this community work since 2013. Because I believe community participation is very important in whatever you do. Whether you work with children, women, elder, anything you do, local community participation and support is very necessary. So what we started doing is there, is, uh, there are five church in the area, local church, and they are faith-based organizations which are very good, powerful organization in the community. We started working with them, delivering lectures, doing health camps, helping local community. Like if there was a, a poor student who needed school fees to be given, we tried to arrange that. Uh, we do, did something called picnics for them, uh, talent shows for them. So we started doing all this for an initial days. So this connection helped us in this difficult time. Initially, there were some people were creating difficulty, but they helped us. In fact, we worked with the police also because we distributed them uh, uh, sanitizers, fruit juice, mask, face shield. We worked, when we started working with the community, so we worked with all. So for us, everybody in the community is a stakeholder. So the municipality workers, police people, elder children, everybody is there. Then we also went down and adopted two schools in the local locality which are poor government school where tribal and migrant worker children will go there. Primary school, we give them a uh, textbook, we give them raincoats and other stuff which they require. So this was there. But what happened in the lockdown, what we found, there were a lot of daily wage earners where like auto rickshaw drivers, car drivers, housemates, they were out of job. They could not do a job. So we form a group called We Group and actually help people with groceries um, and medicine around uh, 11,000 people, around 1,500 families. Wow. Out and, yes, we form a group and it was really good. And uh, believe me, in this difficult lockdown time, there were a lot of negative negativity outside, but we feel so nice, elevated with this positive aura of helping people. Uh, actually, this is one thing we kept us going. And uh, uh, people blessed us, and we—it—it uh, it, it was like uh, so, somewhere humanity has come about this COVID. I think I—I I could thank COVID because it's trying to give humanity a chance to again survive. We were dead. We were dead skin. I think now the new skin is coming up. Oh, I, I love that. How can I ask how you are funded? Because you're doing so many different things. And my guess is you probably have a, a good volunteer base, but still some of this yeah. stuff when you're giving it away, you know, things need to be purchased and stuff. So how are you yeah. funded? So uh, as a silver ending with a social enterprise, we don't have any funding base. We have created our own base and our home creates a revenue. That is one thing we have some revenue. But when you start doing this humanitarian work, you need a lot of funds. So when we started, we had this five, six people group and we don't, uh, contributed from ourselves, example, $5,000 each, suppose. And then we uh, created an amount like 700 rupees, Indian rupees for one kit. So we sent out messages on social media. This social media was really helpful. And uh, we told them that this is the, what we are doing and people just poured in, poured in. Like, I can't imagine there are so many good people out there we always talk about bad people, but I think there's so many helpful people. They just keep on donating. In fact, at some time we have to say, stop, don't give funds now. So, wow. It, yes. So people help and not only us, uh, we were initial again, we started on the 20th March. We were one of the first to start this uh, help for with grocery and food. There are many people started 
and it has been a very good experience for all of us and things are better now in india after nine, we are unlocking now but people helped us funding was i think if you do good work nobody stops you god will also help you i think that's wonderful i know here in the us with um food and stuff so many people are are getting assistance that and it's not an embarrassment to go to go pick it up people are so grateful and they are so uh, they're thrilled to give it away i mean it's it's not like oh it's you again you know type thing and so just the the attitude in which it's being being given to somebody is totally different and yeah. um and it's you know with between the covid and people losing their jobs and it's it's people of all you know economic and um races and the whole nine yards is just affecting everybody so it's it's equaled the playing field and 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 it's it would be nice for them to be able to figure out how do we do that all the time you know because there are still people in need you know yes. or dealing with our homeless population or whatever it might be and mm -hmm. i think so often you were right you know you said you know we hear about all the bad stuff but we don't hear about the good stuff and i think that's how we've been trained what as to what news is and i think we can be retrained if media yes. would focus on that and if people you know people are sharing more just like the little i don't know if for um schools and stuff here the the teachers and we're doing parades around the neighborhoods for the kids in the cars and just driving by and waving and honking and they had the police and fire department you know and and the kids were thinking it's cool and the parents are crying going wow this is really something <laughs> you know and it was just it was again just to make those connections and we can we can all do so much better so much better what what kind of message do you have for families who are dealing with a loved one for you know with dementia so for the families i think uh, here uh, i would like to uh, stress upon my learning in australia what i had in 2 uh, two, 3 years ago i went for the training for spark of life uh, dementia care international for master training of dementia there i found something again new like eden alternative the spark of life is the philosophy of way of you know being with the highest intent to live the spirit awaken the dormant abilities and heal the relationship it is it is about how to connect with the person how to communicate how to care them care for them and also to tell them that we are, we have we have to make them feel that they are comfortable they are wanted they belong to the family i think it's about kindness compassion and pity what we uh, um, you know uh, try to bring and in all this dementia thing very important is we uh, always talk about uh, disability the problems the person is doing we forget the abilities we forget he or she was music teacher we forget she had uh, she had a cooking ability we mm -hmm. forget somebody was dancing so like we forget the game they played in the childhood we need to try to bring that ability back and here uh, jane who is the founder of international uh, dementia care international she has a very nice quote and in my book also i have mentioned this i would like to read this it is not other person's behavior that causes our reaction instead it is our judgment about the behavior that triggers our reaction so a person with dementia might not know your name the relationship about you and him or her they might not recognize your face but deep inside their heart they connect with you the person with dementia you know uh, might forget from here but remembers from heart just think that he or she is a human being is a family and just imagine if you also get into that situation how people want to behave with you try to be uh, for them and doing all this caring for your family members please note you also are going to be under stress to take care of yourself practice some yoga practice some dance go for shopping take a break taking break is very important take help share the responsibility of your family members and if required take a professional help it is not stigma don't be ashamed don't be shy to take help because if you're taking help if you are in good sense if you have good aura you will help the dementia person much better way 
Oh, I so agree. And I love that you talk about the reaction and the behavior and things. Um, I don't know if you know um, Gareth Benninger, who I, I think his yeah. book is called uh, Moving Ahead by Standing Still. And he, okay. you know, says, you know, stop using the word behavior. It's a reaction. It's a clue. It's a signal. Something's off. It's our job to figure that out. And, yes. and you know, I think one of the most beautiful things that dementia has taught me is everything that I've learned for dementia, I can apply in all of my life. I mean, they're just beautiful life lessons on how to, how to be a better person, how to communicate, how to, how to calm yourself, how to, even, how to even know what it is you like to do. I mean, I lost that when I was caring for both my, my folks with my dad with brain cancer, my mom with dementia. And then I, you know, was working full time, was married, had a, a young daughter, took someone else into the house on top of that. And you know, you're managing all these different things. And then I remember when my dad died, I didn't know, I didn't know who I was anymore. And people would be like, well, what do you like to do? I let go of all of that. I wasn't balanced. I thought I was, I was balancing things, but I wasn't balanced at my core. And then I had to learn what it is I like again. And so don't, you know, don't let go of those things you cherish, you know, find your joy, maintain it it might look different um, yes. but you're also going to find i think deeper connections as the disease progresses you're going to mm -hmm. find that that's the simple things that melt your heart you know and when we get out of our head and into our heart and live live by our heart um, things just become calmer they become easier and i think you're you're able to let go of some of those things that you were trying mm -hmm. to control before that that we don't control yes, and learn to embrace life. So <clears throat> I would really recommend, you know, people um, purchasing your book. And again, that is called Remember Me, yes. um, You, Me, and Dementia. And you can get that on Amazon as well. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, wonderful. And I'll drop that in too. So um, okay. along with uh, having them go to, to Amazon. Um, <clears throat> what... What's next for you? You know, you're always doing something. You must have something in your craw that you're thinking about. So what's the, what's the next step you see for you? Yeah. So yeah, I'll just also, before we uh, talk about this, I will talk about this purple dot. Okay. <laughs> so purple dot challenge is going on. Uh, it's, uh, June is World Elder Abuse Awareness Month. 15 June was the day. So we stand with older person. So purple dot is for everybody, all age group to come ahead and, uh, you know, we, we try to integrate all age group. And in fact, this has been very good hit on social media. People are posting pictures in purple dot uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So I think here, whenever we work with old people, whenever we work with dementia, involve everybody. Don't only talk about family, don't only talk about old people, involve children, students, youth, all stakeholders, lawyers, judges, police, everybody, they all are there to help. Somebody needs to ask help. So it thought people, of course, people might be busy, but there are amazing young people who are doing amazing work. They are very energetic, they have good ideas. I think that is what we are trying to connect next. And also, uh, I want to, uh, looking forward to not only sell this book, but I want to, trans my, my dream, is to translate this book in Indian languages. There are more, more around 15 to 17 languages in, in native languages, in two, three languages, if we can uh, translate. This has 43 chapters on what are dementia, Alzheimer's, stories of caregiving, resources. So it will go deep inside a home, like it's a self book, self help book. So it will help people. So this is one plan. And next is because COVID taught us about. A website, internet-based activities. So we are exploring some new things you will hear soon. <laughs> oh, wonderful. You said internet activities? Yes. Okay. So it, when you say internet activities, um, I know there's a place called Maria's Place that has all kinds of yes. activities that people can download and do, but are you talking about interactive on the internet type of activities, or are you talking a place for resources for activities? Uh, it, it will be everything. It will be like, again, one stop where resources, uh, um, shopping, it can be about talk. It, it will, it will, it is uh, for the family. Okay. 
Okay. We need to help families. Okay. So we need they for them to make things easier. So that is whole idea. So this uh, lockdown has given us lot of thought. Lot many uh, calls and emails came to us of different type of help people require. And I think internet internet is one of the fastest way to reach out to lot of people. Uh, because we, you and me can't travel every day to do law talk and awareness. It is a lot of money, but internet is faster, easier. And if you have smartphone, uh, then again, it, everybody is having now. And through children, through youth, you go inside the house through the smartphone and make the things better for them. Wonderful. Well, Salish, thank you so much time, for your time today. This has just been a wonderful conversation. I, I really appreciate all you are doing and taking the time to share with us. Um, it's amazing. If you're, if you're not connected to him on Facebook, please do that because what you'll see there will just lift your soul and give you some ideas. And you can also go to silverinnings.in. That's the website, silverinnings.in. And you can email him as well at silverinnings at gmail.com, silverinnings at gmail.com. So again, thank you so much. Continue the great work. And let's not, let's not wait this long to Namaste. have you back on the show, okay? Namaste from India. Oh, namaste. Thank you. So again, I just want to thank everybody for either watching or listening, whichever mode you chose. And I hope that you will share and like this episode because there's so much that we can learn from Salish. He's doing wonderful work in India. His attitude in terms of just being positive and rewarding uh, for our elders, as well as engaging for those who care is just absolutely fantastic. So I can't wait to see what he uh, comes up with next and to have him back on the show. We waited way too long on that one. If you're interested in checking out what Alzheimer Speaks is up to, uh, just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. Uh, check out our homepage. That'll highlight things like the radio show, recent radio show episodes. It will have on there dementia chats, um, which are videos of people with dementia telling us what they'd like the world to be like. Um, and they have great insights. Uh, dementia quick tips, which are things I wish someone would have told me on my 30-year journey with my mom, um, events, and so much more. There's also initiatives and projects page where you can find out things about becoming dementia friendly, uh, maybe uh, opening up a memory cafe, um, and many other, many other things there like the Purple Angel program. Or if you're interested in a, a speaker, a trainer, or a consultant, I do that as well, and I'd love to talk with you. Uh, so have a wonderful, wonderful week, and we'll talk soon, everyone. Bye now.